Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of eDiscovery After Hours. This is the fifth episode to air. It's actually the first one that I recorded months ago at this point. When I got the idea to spin up this uh, podcast, uh, multiple people told me, you know, you really need to record the first episode or two with people you're really comfortable with, you have good rapport with, because it is different when you're talking behind a mic or when you're speaking on camera. And, and I found that to be true. And I could not have asked for a better guest than Sri Sharma, uh, whose episode airs today. I pitched the idea to her. She was a total champ and uh, I'm very, very grateful. So you'll probably notice if you're watching this some poor image quality before I had an external camera. Uh, so some bad audio quality before I had an external mic <laughs> and some pretty rough uh, hosting abilities, let's say. Uh, but I, I had a great, great time during this conversation. I hope you enjoyed as well. Another thing that you may notice if you're watching in Shree's virtual background, um, it's for a company that no longer exists. It was her consulting uh, shop that she was running. She has since uh, joined Haystack ID as their VP of business development. So very grateful to Shree for coming on. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Today's sponsor is Discovery Master. If you are using Relativity uh, in multiple different instances for document review and you want one login to track everything, check out www.discoverymaster.co. Thanks and enjoy the show. Drink time! You don't know how to drink your whole generation. Drinks on the house. Yes, sir. Now, wait a second. Drinks are 50% off. Right. Now, wait a second. Double the price of everything. And I work only 16 hours a day. A union man only works eight hours a day. I belong to two unions. And now, e-discovery after hours with your host, Ryan Short. Sri Sharma, welcome to e-discovery after hours. Thank Cheers. you very much. Appreciate you having me here. Oh, all right. I'm so rude. I was just going to put it down without zipping. No, no, no. So, so the guest picks the beverage. So I, I couldn't be, I couldn't possibly ignore that. What are we drinking, Shree? Ryan, we're drinking Glenn Fittick and I'm doing Glenn Fittick 15. Shout out to my friend, Jeffrey Hazlett of C-Suite Network for turning me on to Glenn Fittick. Well played. I was not a scotch drinker before I knew uh, Jeffrey. When did you meet Jeffrey? Not that terribly long ago in November, I was invited to a networking event for his group, C-Suite Network. And one of their events is Sunday night. It's uh, Scotch Sundays, really kind of off the cuff, just very relaxed, 9 p.m. And it's a group of people, totally unstructured networking, which I also really enjoy on occasion. And everybody brings their favorite Scotch and I had no Scotch to bring. So he, he remedied that for me. <laughs> Well, it's a good it's a good drink to get turned on to in November in Boston, uh, and we'll come back to Boston in just a minute. And it's also a really good way to make sure that Monday morning you start off feeling extra good, extra energetic for the week ahead. Exactly. Depends how many scotches you throw back, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, Shri, let's start at the beginning, right? This is a show about the people of the industry, not about the work of the industry. Uh, so let's talk about you. Where are you from originally? I like to say I'm a Californian by birth, breeding, and sentiment. If I were confident the camera would focus, I would hold up my Lakers iPhone case, but I'm not confident of the camera. Yeah. <laughs> That's bold. I still, as a Pacers fan, still have salty feelings about the 2000 NBA Finals. So maybe we'll just edit this out of the show later. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, moving on, moving on. <laughs> now, when you say L.A., do you mean like city proper or which part of the L.A. area? I was born in LA. I was born at Cedar sinai and then I was raised in kind of all over uh, Southern California, but ended in South Orange County. So that tends to be where I call home. Nice. Do you get back home very often? Not as often as I'd like and uh, not so much in 2020. Last time I was home for was for my law school best friend's wedding. Okay. Well, that's a good reason to go home. It was. It was a beautiful wedding. Do you have siblings? Are you only child? I have one sister. Funny you should say those two, ask those two questions back to back because in some ways, both. I have an older sister, but she's 12 and a half years my senior. So she was going away to college pretty much when I started having memories. Yeah. See, so that's funny because I am the oldest of five and we're 
I'm the oldest, the youngest is only eight years behind me. So to be, to have a 12 year gap, I'm thinking, holy cow, right? That's a lot of, uh, you know, there, there's a big age range there. <laughs> there is a big age range. And you grew up in the Midwest, right? Yeah, I grew up in a tiny town that you haven't heard of before. <laughs> How do you know that? Because Yorktown, Indiana is not a thriving metropolis. In okay, fact, you got me there. <laughs> yeah, well, when I grew up, the big news was that we doubled in population because we annexed. So we went from like 4,000 residents to almost 9,000. So that was a, you know, I bet the big city near me was Muncie, Indiana, which you probably also haven't heard of. In that case, I actually have heard of Muncie. M-U-N-C-I-E. See, I can spell it. Because you must be a Parks and Rec fan. That's the only reason that you would. <laughs> I've never seen Parks and Rec. I think we've talked about this. I live under a rock. I don't watch TV. That's sad. That's sad. <laughs> it is sad. Oh. It is sad. So sad that you need a drink. <laughs> oh, well, you suggested it. It's my, I, it's my obligation. Now, okay, so you grew up in South Orange County, right? Which, like, as a kid from the cornfields of Indiana, that was, like, the, all those MTV shows, right? Just the glitz and glamour. Right. How accurate a portrayal is the, the, the 2000 MTV shows of your childhood? You're asking me this on the heels of my saying I'm a troglodyte. <laughs> I can tell you, roughly speaking, that I think uh, Orange County gets glammed up a lot in its TV portrayals. My recollection is, and I've been gone a long time, but my recollection is it's really just a very safe suburban coastal place. It's yeah. beautiful. It is incredibly beautiful. I don't know how glamorous I experienced it to be. So when you're growing up in this very safe suburban space, what what's the dream when you're growing up, right? What, what's what, you know, are you going to walk on the moon? Are you going to be a, a, you know, go into the ballet, right? What, what's the path that you're chasing at this point? You know, I, as a child growing up, idolized my dad who was an attorney by training, although he was a business person. So I think the dream was just to follow in his footsteps and get the law degree. I actually never thought I'd practice law. So in many ways, my Serial entrepreneurship has been maybe trying to follow um, unsuccessfully in his footsteps. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the dream was really go to law school and, and end up in some form of business pursuit. What? I wasn't sure. So you're one of the few who like when you're 12 or 15 years old, you actually know what you want to do with your life, right? You're going to law school. And then you're 25 and you're out of law school and you're like, oh, what now? <laughs> you know, there are some drawbacks to deciding really early in your life what you want to do because maybe what you wanted at 12 isn't going to be what you want to do at 40. Okay, fair. Do you remember that old high school speech that circulated around, I'm dating myself like a lot right now, but I think it was around uh, 97 that said something like, don't worry. It was supposed to be a commencement speech for high school students. Don't worry if you don't know what you want to do uh, with your life. Some of the most interesting adults I know still don't know. Who said that? I, I'm going to have to come back to you on it because I think it was falsely attributed so many times that I actually never committed to memory who actually wrote it. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to Google it and put it in the show notes. Okay. I think you should. It was actually, it, it's worth reading. So what were you like as a kid, Shri? Were you outgoing, the class clown, real studious and serious? Who were you? Incredibly studious. Incredibly studious. I was just a quiet, chunky kid uh, who read a lot of books. What kind of books? Sorry? What kind of books? Anything I could find in my dad's library. He had a really voluminous library. And I remember, I do remember him at one point, um, I pulled a D.H. Lawrence book off <laughs> the shelf. And I remember him, I don't even remember which book it was, but I remember him taking it from me and putting it on a, a, like an upper shelf and being like, when you're around 14 or 15, you can read that. <laughs> but uh, you know what? As you're saying that, I'm remembering Judy Bloom. Oh, my gosh. The yeah. Fudge series. Do you remember those? Yeah. She, it, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, right? Was that her? Oh, yeah. Big my sister, my sister had that one. Yeah. I'm not going to admit to reading it on air, but I've, I've, I know what it looks like. Your secret is safe with me and all your yeah. viewers. Right? Yeah. Yeah. All 13 people are like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Here comes a LinkedIn message, right? A text blown up. 
Uh, that's funny. So you said you're a real serious, real studious. Um, so typically I find that there's one of two truths, right, in, in uh, what I've observed, because even though I lived in a small town, there was a university there. And so there was a lot of professors. And so, you know, there was a fair amount of diversity for the size of town, right? So I typically find that the kids who were super serious and studious, either their parents were highly educated or their parents were immigrants or both. So obviously your dad was an attorney. Uh, you know, what, what were your parents or grandparents immigrants? You know, was your, was your mom or your other grandparents, you know, were they attorneys or business leaders as well? What was kind of the family context that drove these characteristics? So, yes, I think to all of the above. I lost track of the questions, but yes, the whole family immigrated. Um, so I'm the first generation to be American born. And yeah, there was a great deal of education. And in Indian culture, education is really prioritized. So I, I would speculate that even if I hadn't had the experience of an educated family, it would have been provided to me and really pushed for me. Yeah, that's awesome. So where did you do undergrad? UC Santa Barbara. Which is like the most beautiful place in the world. I know you said that about OC, but Santa Barbara, I mean, come on. There, there's a reason it's called the American Riviera, Ryan. It's incredibly beautiful and I have wonderful memories of the entire place. So the university is in a little um, hamlet, it's in a little hamlet called Goleta. Yeah. And so it's outside of Santa Barbara proper, which meant you got the university experience kind of tucked away, but you could also go into the city of Santa Barbara and experience that. Yeah. I have just some of the happiest memories. Yeah, which is perfect. And then if memory serves, you jumped all the way to the other corner of the country. I think law school at Miami, is that right? Yes, sir. I didn't want to be born and raised and live and die in the same place without experiencing something else. So uh, the two best law schools I got into were SUNY Buffalo and <laughs> University of Miami. And what was the deciding factor there? I mean, it couldn't possibly have been the average Fahrenheit temperature, right? <laughs> definitely not that. And definitely not because the weekend I got my admission letter to SUNY Buffalo, Buffalo got what even by Buffalo standards was a historic snowstorm that delivered something like three feet of snow overnight. Yeah. And I just decided I had a friend who was from Pennsylvania and she's like, oh, your ignition will freeze up. And she's, she's describing all these horrible things I'll have to live through in a cold climate and telling me, don't worry, you'll get used to it. And meanwhile, so I have this SUNY Buffalo packet, admissions packet in one hand, and I have a University of Miami admissions packet in the other. And <laughs> not a tough choice. Not a tough choice, Ryan. So one of the attorneys uh, that I work fairly closely with is uh, a Miami grad. And it's right now, it's outside, we're in Indianapolis. It, you probably can't see the snow that's clinging to the rafters outside my window, but it's like 11 degrees. And I, I'm pretty sure he's waiting for us to open up like a South Beach office. So <laughs> he might be waiting for a while. <laughs> uh, all right, so, so you've bounced around each corner of the country, right? So you go, you grow up in Southern California, you go to school out in Florida, and then a lot of times I, after school, people either kind of stick to where their new kind of flag has been planted, so to speak, and they have that support system and they know the city. Um, or a lot of times you'll see people go home. So what did you do? You, you graduate from law school, right? And what was the intention, right? You said that you didn't think you would ever practice law. So was it to go work for, you know, PE or to go work for the big four doing M&A and advising? I mean, what was, what was the, the path that you, had on paper that you were going to take and what and then what happened yeah exactly there's a plan and then there's what happens right yeah. so the plan was to graduate from law school and then work in the family business that's not what ended up happening can i ask what the family business is they did a variety of things over the years uh and at the time that i graduated from law school they were commercial real estate developers in california and texas Very nice. So that was the plan. Uh, the actuality was I got into a relationship that became very serious. And so I ended up staying in Miami. As tends to happen. That happens, right? <laughs> so what did you do with your law degree? So I did a variety of things. I did work at a couple of firms and I don't know that I was ever designed to be a lawyer uh, long-term. 
I then got into the restaurant business. It was something I was totally unprepared for coming out of the law firm world and never having been a business owner in my own right. So my takeaway from the entire experience is that, especially in a franchise setting, you need to own a couple hundred or you need to be boots on the ground running it yourself. And I was neither. (laughs) So best of both worlds is what you're telling me. (laughs) <laughs> yes, best of both worlds. Yeah. Have you had any adventures uh, of entrepreneurship yourself, Ryan? Yeah, I'm living one right now in the e-discovery world. <laughs> I am a non-attorney MBA who was recruited into the e-discovery space last January and February, signed my offer, came into work on Monday, and then on Wednesday, the entire world shut down because of COVID-19. So... Our go-to-market plan for the software that we're commercializing um, was stay home. <laughs> yeah, no it, market. It, was, it was set up a card table in the master bedroom closet and uh, start emailing all these people that I had assumed that I was going to meet at trade shows and conferences. So I, you know, it sounds like we both had pretty sexy experiences. <laughs> now, the the good thing for me, right, is that new discovery has been a tight enough a tight knit enough community that people have been really supportive. And, um, you know, obviously it was a bump in the road from a timing perspective and an operational perspective, but, um, we've been all things considered, we've been really pleased with, with how, you know, the rollout has gone and what the reception has been like and, um, the connections that have been made and introduction, you know, introductions that have been offered. So, um, but yeah, I, yeah, it's, uh, entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. Or the week of stomach. And with that said, I'm going to have I'm gonna have another, another drink just to make sure I go home feeling extra good tonight. <laughs> I'm joining you, Ryan. <laughs> so, all right, you... Wait, wait, have, wait. Let me stop you. What do you think of the Glenfiddich? Oh, my gosh. You, see, you act like I'm a novice, right? I have been drinking scotch, right, for a little bit longer than that since last November. Uh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> yeah, but, but good choice. But I, I'm a fan. I, I did not object when you texted me the, the choice. So that was good. Um, so, Shri, you know, whether it's entrepreneurship, bumps in the road, you mentioned a relationship that got, you know, real serious and kind of took you on a different path. Um, you know, what what is your, you know, like belief system or value system or what do you, how do you navigate those choppy waters? Like, what do you lean on or rely on to to keep you putting one foot in front of the other? I rely on a years long meditation practice and a belief that, uh, so it's funny, the word karma gets thrown around all, every which way from Sunday with almost no context, but it's actually pronounced karma. So it's a Hindu word. It's a, it's a Sanskrit word. And so it forms, I'm being born and brought up Hindu, the idea of karma and things coming to you as a result of your past actions and the experiences you're having being designed to guide you toward a higher state of evolution as you travel through this physical experience that has really informed my life. And at some of the more challenging times. And we're, you know, we're certainly, I think, globally moving through one of those challenging times. At those times, it's kept me from an excessive dose of self-pity because there's always this guiding, this sort of baseline principle and a baseline belief for me that things are, I believe this so much that I have it tattooed on my back from Desiderata. Um, the world is unfolding as it should, therefore be at peace. Oh, that's really cool. I love that. Thanks. I don't have a matching tattoo, but, um, you know, maybe if I have some more clinic, I'll, I'll end up with one. <laughs> if so, really- I want pictures. I want pictures. So do you consider this, um, you know, a, a uh, kind of a philosophical value system, a religious value system, a uh, just like a, hey, this just feels good, so I'm going to just lean in when I need it value system? Like what, I guess what, you know, how close is this to the center of your identity and, and how do you really implement this? Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's such a good question. And there is a robust debate on this topic as to whether it's a philosophical system or a religious system. It's my religion. And so it is 
the guiding principle for how I live my life and how I make sense of how I orient myself as a member of this world. I love that. That's awesome. And I love seeing when people lean into their faith, right? Because it's challenging to do that in, in today's environment. Um, and so, yeah, many, many kudos, many props to you. I love that. Awesome. Uh, okay. So I would be remiss, Shri, in spite of the fact that this is a show about the people of the industry, we're all in the same industry, right? So, um, you know, tell me in the e-discovery world, what's, 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 what's top of mind for you right now? What do you want to unpack or, or what's, what, you know, what are the, what are the conversations that you're constantly having these days? What's top of mind for me dovetails exactly with the conversations I'm repeatedly having with clients these days. And that relates to how pricing models are evolving to account for the fact that there is not the same overhead of physically secured facilities for document review to be performed and how that is going to evolve long-term as we see what happens with COVID and evaluate how clients or how much clients are willing to pay uh, for document review. I'm going to be interested to see how, how that shakes out in the longer term. Are you seeing this as like a hypothetical that people are starting to bandy about in conversation? Or are you already starting to see, you know, pushback on new RFPs or new projects where people are saying, you know, hey, you don't have butts and seats under a roof that you're paying for anymore, so you need to cut these rates. I mean, how... How tangible is this shift and how theoretical is it? At this point, I think it's more theoretical moving toward tangible, but I do think that e-discovery is no longer a new term or concept among seasoned users, right? So it's going to be the seasoned users and corporate legal departments who are going to be leading the charge on the pushback when that does happen. Yeah. And do you have any kind of sense of where we'll come down, whether it'll just be a reduced hourly rate or flat fees or project-based, you know, bids, any, any, any predictions into that sphere? I wish I had a prediction, but I'm not in the ha habit of making predictions because I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to be, uh, what did I learn in my MBA? You know, statisticians, economists, they'll always say that there's like a 45% certainty of something happening. So that way, if it comes true, they're like, see, I told you there was a good chance. But if it doesn't come true, like, well, I didn't say it was likely. I said it was possible, right? <laughs> then in that case, 45% chance. We'll, we'll have to start, uh, let's talk to our buddy Jason over at Use Discovery Advisory and the three of us can start a research arm where we publish all, everything at like 45% likelihood of happening. Let's see if that gains any traction. Cheers to that, my friend. <laughs> Shree, if people want to reach out to you and talk more, where can they reach you? They can find me on LinkedIn or they can reach out to me through the website, www.summitediscovery.com. Awesome. Love it. So good to talk to you today. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Ryan.